I got to tell y'all a story, all right? And um, it's not really a story, it's kind of my life. So um, I kind of grew up loving Now and Laters. Anybody in here a Now and Later fan? Okay, so let me, let me see, by show of hands, who in here is a Now and Later fan? Okay, listen, I got a few Now and Laters. Can I get two people to come up here and get a Now and Later? Anybody want a Now and Later? Okay, we got one right here. We got one right here, okay. One more now, okay, she, did, she tried to take the microphone from me over a now and later. Okay, by a show of hands, who in here is not a now and later fan? Okay, saints, if you look around the room, these are the people that don't know Jesus. Uh, these are the people that, that aren't saved, but you know what, hey look, the good news is that, um, you know, salvation will be preached today. We're gonna preach Christ and they're gonna have an opportunity to come to know Jesus. I believe Princess and some of the others, we got people that specialize in deliverance. And so I believe that some of them who don't like now and may need that ministry a little bit more than others, but hey, you know what? I'm not here to judge at all. You know, but you know what's crazy? For me, it's not just the taste of now and laters that really satisfy my soul. For, for me, Deke, it's the experience. And so for me, okay, so this is what I mean by the experience of now and laters. So like, when you eat the now and later, it isn't exactly easy because half of the battle is open in the now and later. Am, am I, can I preach to somebody today? That's, that's half of the battle. No, seriously, that is truly half of the battle. And so for me, you know, I kinda, I don't, I wouldn't say that I have anger issues. I, I, I definitely don't agree that I have anger issues, but for me, I kinda get a little ticked off when people, they see me struggling, and they volunteer to help me. Now, I, I get it, some of you are probably like, well, it's kind of backwards because I would assume that you would get a bit agitated if they did not volunteer to help you, but for me, it's different. I get agitated or a bit irritated, I should say, when people do volunteer to help me. Let me tell you why. Because for me, it's almost as if when you leave a little bit of paper residue on that now and later, if the saints of God are in this place, can you just agree that it hits differently? It hit differently. Listen, I don't know. Look, maybe it was just me, but it, it hit differently when you leave just a little bit of paper residue. And so I've been convinced since I was a child that that was the whole point of the now and later wrapper paper being on there so tightly because I just knew that the people who created it, they said, look, when you leave just a little bit of paper on there, it just kind of makes the experience that much more better. And look, saints, I see some of y'all out there being judgy. I see you like, Ugh, you eat it with the paper on there? First off, mind your business. Um, <laughs> second of all, yes, I do eat it like that. And you know what, I'm gonna just say this, and we are gonna get into Luke chapter 10. It's 2019, and some of y'all still out here eating chitlins. So, um, come on now. Some of y'all still eating chitlins. So listen, let me, let me ask you guys to make a deal with me. If you don't judge me from the pews, I won't judge you from the pulpit. Can we, can we agree to do that? Okay, all right, look. What does this have to do with Luke chapter 10? Well, I believe that Jesus, much like myself, is drawing us into the, the point of, the whole point, I should say, of our earthly experience. And so for me, you know, the candy wrapper, I told you guys that since I was a kid, I've been convinced that that's why the paper was on there so tightly. I've been convinced that that was the whole point. Like they, they wanted you to have to struggle and leave just a little bit on there so you can get that unique taste, if you will. Well, I believe that in Luke chapter 10, Jesus, just much like myself, is drawing us into the whole point of our earthly experience. And so let's look at it. Um, I think that in this passage, I, I love it so much because here Jesus is drawing us to a conclusion. He, he's actually comparing and contrasting two ways of life, if you will, and he uses it by doing it through two women. Now, this story in Luke chapter 10 is about two women. One name is Martha and the other's name is Mary. And now, if you aren't too familiar with this story, this, this isn't Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is actually Mary, a devoted follower of Christ. And so if you're familiar with this story, Martha is kind of portrayed as the bad guy, if you will. But I would like to argue that most of us are kind of more like Martha than we are Mary. 
And so I'll explain. In this passage, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, and he's welcomed by Mary into her home, Mary and Martha. And so most people, when you invite somebody to your house, you want to make sure that the house is tidy. You want to make sure that your kids is on their best behavior. You want to make sure that you ain't got to whoop nobody and embarrass yourself. You know, look, growing up in the house of the bishop, we always had guests. So we got the whooping before they came over, just to make sure that we was ready in advance. There wasn't going to be no whoopings in between because you're not going to make me look bad as bishop. You get whooped before or after. You can pick. So anyway, look. So, so this is it's funny because, like, Martha, she's like, I got to get the house ready. And basically, she has a point because she's about to host the leading candidate of messiahship. What does that mean? That means that at this time, these people grew up in Jewish culture. And so basically, they grew up knowing that one day a savior would come. One day a messiah would come. And so basically, Jesus is the leading candidate for this Messiah person. We're seeing them do miracles and signs and wonders. And so now I'm about to host this guy in my house, the incarnate Yahweh, if you will. I gotta make sure that the house is clean. And so this is, this, this, this is Martha's mentality, but Martha and Mary are two extremely different people that handle this situation very differently. And so Martha, she decides to get the house together. Mary, Mary decides to sit at the feet of Jesus. Now, Martha is busy cooking, she's cleaning, she's getting the house together, and she's doing a lot in the kitchen. Mary, on the other hand, is starstruck as she's sitting in the living room just listening at the feet of Jesus. And so you see very different perspectives, very different vantage points, if you will. Martha is busy. She's getting the house. Mary is like, wow, Jesus, awesome. You know, so I feel like I'm close to Martha because, like, when I was growing up, my parents, you know, they, they gave us chores and stuff, and so they told us to clean up the house, whatever, stuff like that. And I was cool with that because chores, they help you build character. I believe that. And so, um, basically, if I felt like my siblings weren't helping out, oh, I was snitching. Listen, I know the saying, snitches get stitches. But, <laughs> but, but, listen, if my siblings weren't helping out like I felt like they should have been helping out, I was telling. And you know, it's funny as I think about this, but essentially, this is what Martha does. Can we get Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 40 back on the screen, please? And we're going to look at it from the message version. So I want to kind of read this. We're going to look at the first two verses, excuse me. It says, as they continued their travel, Jesus entered a village. A woman by the name of Martha welcomed him and made him feel quite at home. She had a sister, Mary, who sat before the master, hanging on every word he said, but Martha was pulled away by all she had to do in the kitchen. Later, she stepped in, interrupting them. <laughs> hey, uh, Jesus, you see, um, uh, yeah, I, I see that you and Mary, you know, y'all getting close, y'all talking and whatnot, but uh, I kind of need some help in the kitchen. It says here that Martha says, Master, don't you care that my sister has abandoned the kitchen to me. Tell her to lend me a hand or I'm going to lay these hands on her. Okay, maybe they didn't say it like that, but uh, I got a little carried away, but you get the point. Much like myself, Martha in this passage is snitching on her sibling. Now listen, Martha and Mary, they both love Jesus. And on this one occasion, although it may not look like it, Martha and Mary are both serving Jesus. They're, they're both serving Jesus, but the problem here is that Martha felt like Mary's style of servitude was inferior to hers. You see, this is a problem. Martha felt like Mary's style of serving was inferior to hers, but what Martha didn't realize was that in her attempt to serve, she was actually neglecting her guest. In her attempt to serve, she was neglecting her guest. And my question is, how many of our relationships with God is defined by that same logic? Have you gotten so busy in church that you've neglected the cornerstone of the church? Have you gotten so busy? You see, because there's a difference between being active and involved in church ministry and being active and involved in a healthy 
relationship with Jesus. And before you clap, know this, there is no shade towards church ministry being thrown here. Don't confuse the words. What I'm saying is that a healthy relationship with Jesus as a believer is your priority. Even before you get involved, a healthy relationship with Jesus is your priority. And so if you have a healthy relationship with Jesus, the likelihood is this. You're going to also be involved in church ministry. But your relationship with Jesus has to precede it. You see, where there is activity without intimacy, there is no relationship. And so here's what you need to know. This is ultimately Jesus' whole point in this passage. We could end this sermon here because this is what Jesus is saying. If we go back and look at verses 41 and 42, you can get that on the screen. But the whole point of what Jesus is expressing here is that there is a difference between activity and intimacy. There is a very big difference. And so he's ultimately saying that somewhere along the line, we as believers has confused the two, if you will. But in this passage, you see that there is a difference. And so let's look at verses 41 through 42. It says, Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and you're getting yourself worked up over nothing. One thing only is essential and Mary has chosen it. It's the main course and it won't be taken from her. Now, most scholars assume that Martha was in the kitchen. So I find it so ironic that Martha is in the kitchen and she's preparing a meal, but she's missing the main course. She's in the kitchen preparing a meal, missing the main course. Is there somebody in service today so busy within the kitchen of life that you've neglected the point of it. And that's that we would have intimate moments with our creator. And so throughout this passage, Jesus is drawing us into the reality of the whole point of our earthly experience. And the whole point of our earthly experience is that we would spend as much time as possible experiencing and encountering moments with Jesus. And so with that being said, I believe that God wants us to know that we aren't to let anybody define or box in what an encounter with him ought to look like. Now, yes, your encounters with God should be consistent with the scriptures. I don't want nobody in here barking and foaming at the mouth talking about you caught the Holy Spirit. Listen, every goosebump isn't God. But what I'm saying is this. There are some people like Martha in this passage who would like to undermine the way that you serve and experience and encounter Jesus just because it isn't consistent with the way that they serve and experience and encounter Jesus. And so you aren't to let anybody define or box in what your examples or your encounters with God ought to look like. Now, let me give you an example. One of my favorite passages in scriptures is, is, is Acts 2. Now, if you're familiar with Acts 2, Acts 2 is really special. It's a monumental moment in the history of the early church. In Acts 2, revival happens. People are being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that people start speaking in native and unknown tongue, tongues. Excuse me. It says that people are being filled with the Holy Ghost. Fire and flames are falling from the sky. That was an amazing experience. But I would, like to, I would like to suggest that the same encounter that Mary of Bethany has right here in Luke chapter 10 is no greater or no lesser than that same one that Acts chapter 2 experience, and let me tell you why. Just because God may not have visited you in your dreams like Daniel, or maybe spoke to you on a mountain like Moses, or maybe he hasn't shown you the glory of heaven like he did for John when he literally gets the book of Revelation. Maybe God has never invited you into a transfiguration-like moment like he did for Peter and James and John. But I would like to say that the presence of God is simply God being present. The presence of God is not limited to a goose bump. It's not limited to a praise break. The presence of God is simply God being present. Is there anybody in the house today who believed that just maybe I may be in the presence of God even now? If you've ever sat at the feet of Jesus, maybe like Mary in this passage here in Luke chapter 10, I would like to suggest that you've encountered the living God. And not only have you encountered the living God, but I believe that it's all the more special because God saw it, 
and because he remembers it. Have you ever just kind of sat still before God and just thought about him? Have you ever just kind of sat in the car, maybe turned on some worship music and just kind of rested in his arms? Have you ever just kind of wanted to journal your thoughts about Jesus, but you couldn't find anything to write, so your, your tears wrote them for you? And so I just kind of believe that maybe your, maybe your encounter, maybe your moment didn't look like any of those things that I just mentioned, but I would like to suggest that, like, maybe some of you have never even told anyone about these moments, but I just want to kind of reassure some people in here that, like, heaven remembers those moments, heaven sees those moments. You see, the Bible, it talks about, like, these many names for God. And, like, one of the names for God in Scripture is Yahweh Roi. And so, basically, that name speaks to the fact that we serve a God who sees. And so, like, I just want to kind of reassure somebody who maybe is in a season where you feel overlooked. Maybe you feel like you're praying, but God isn't responding. Maybe you feel like I've been coming to church, but I feel like God doesn't see me. I just want to kind of reassure some people to know in here that there is a God. And not only is there a God, but there's a God who sees. There's a God who remembers. The Bible talks about this book. It's a book where God literally remembers. Can we, I, I feel like I could show you better than I can tell you. Can we get Malachi 3.16 on the screen? This is what the Bible says in Malachi 3.16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they said. In his presence, a scroll or a book of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about the honor of his name. Can we look at Psalm 56 and 8? It says, you keep, you keep track of all my sorrows. You've collected all my tears in your bottle. You've recorded each one in your book. Wait a minute, why does God have a book? Is it because he's like me to the point where sometimes I got to write things down because I'm forgetful? Well, I hope not, because if that's the case, if God struggles with forgetfulness, then that also implies imperfection. And so, like, where there is imperfection, you cannot classify yourself as God. And so here, here's what I like to point out, that, like, it, it can't be that God has this book because he forgets. Forgetfulness implies imperfection. God would literally lose his credibility as deity, as Yahweh, if he struggled with forgetting, forgetfulness. And so I hope that the answer to that question is not yes, because that leads me to believe that it's something much deeper. And I believe that the reason why God has this book where he remembers is because that he wants us to know that there is, in fact, a creator who is crazy in love with the ones with whom he created in his own image. And so he writes about you. And he has this bottle, according to Psalms 56, 8, where he literally keeps track of all your tears. Why does he do that? I believe it's because he remembers what hurt you. He remembers who hurt you. He remembers those times where you cried your eyes out and you felt like nobody saw it. He remembers those times where you cried your eyes out and you thought it'd never get better. We serve this kind of God. And so he wants you to know today that he cares. He's always cared. So much so that even still to this day, I believe that he still records stuff about you in his book today. And I'm getting ready to come to a close. We've had a busy day. I don't want to prolong it, but I believe that God has given me the ability and the capacity to get straight to the point today. And so I believe that there is a God who is crazy in love with each and every one of you. So much so that he writes about you. He has this bottle. God, wait a minute, you collect my tears? Who is this God? What manner of love is this? I thought that I loved you, but the Bible says that we only can love God because we first were loved by him. And so you been you get to see that sometimes this God that we portray in our mind oftentimes isn't the God of the Bible. That there is a God who initiates a love so great and so deep that every moment you cry, he's recording it because he loves you and he empathizes with you. The Bible says that we have a high priest who we can relate to. And I just love that this is the God who's laid it all down for me. And so I guess that the point of this sermon is that it's so important that we get to know Jesus. But I would also say it's equally important that we're known by Jesus. And so like in light of this book where heaven is just remembering stuff, what could heaven write about you? 
what, what could heaven write about you? And that's not a question that leads you to muster up in your own strength, effort, and deeds, and I gotta work harder. That's not what that question is saying. I simply want you guys to know that I want this community of people at Voices to be remembered in the history books of heaven as ones who just like Mary were enamored at the thought and the idea of sitting before Jesus. Not that we were chasing after encounters or that we were chasing after experiences because you know that chasing after encounters and experiences if not properly motivated can even become idolatrous. You know, I wanna just kind of be a little vulnerable. One time, you know, I, I went to a house church and you know, in this, in this house church, it was the first time where I was baptized in the fire of the Holy Spirit, right? And it was one of the best feelings ever. And I'm like, leaving this house like, oh my goodness, it was an uncontrollable shake. You know, all these different things. I felt like God was literally touching me. And I felt like I was literally resting in the arms of Jesus. And it was one of the most amazing experiences I've ever encountered in my life. And you know what, I left there, like I gotta, I gotta feel that again. I gotta feel that again. I was chasing an experience. I was chasing an encounter. And what I began to find out is that when you chase after Jesus, it's different than chasing after an encounter. Chasing encounters is idolatry. But tracing Jesus, who is the encounter, and who is the experience, that's when you know you've reached a new level of spiritual maturity. And so I want heaven to remember that we were a people who were enamored at sitting before God, sitting before Jesus, just in all of his presence like Mary of Bethany. You know, you can tell when you've reached a new level in your spiritual walk with God, in your Christian experience, when Jesus becomes your journey and destination. You see, there are so many of us who are content with walking with Jesus as long as walking with Jesus leads us to the destination we call blessings. God, if you would walk with me until I get this, I'm content. But if God, you don't show me the blessing, ooh, you know, taking up my cross, denying myself daily, sounds a bit unrealistic if you don't promise me something in the end. But I believe that God is calling us higher here at Voices, that we won't simply chase after materialistic things, but that we would chase after Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our salvation. He says if we would seek him first and his kingdom, everything else would be added onto us. And so here's the thing, there's nothing inherently wrong with wanting materialistic blessings, but we've learned, Jesus, we're the mature church, we've learned that wherever your presence is, Jesus, that's the blessing to me. That is the blessing to me. And so maybe you've been missing the whole point of the human experience up until now. Maybe you've been really busy in the quote-unquote kitchen of life like Martha. I believe that Maybe God is calling you into an intimate relationship even now. And so it's okay if that's where you are. There are many of us who are stuck in this distracted place of just being really busy in the kitchen of life, in the kitchen of ministry, and sometimes just being so active, which is a good thing if we have the right motivations behind it. It's a good thing, but sometimes we're so active that we neglect the person who we're supposed to be doing it for. And so I believe that this is the point of this story. And so I believe that it's in this place of intimacy where real spiritual growth happens. And that's where God begins to reveal to you the secret things of the gospel. The Bible says that Jesus does for us what the law could never do. For what the law could not do, God did by sending his son Jesus to die on a cross for us. It says that he loved the world so much that he gave his only son to die for us, that if we would simply believe in this story we call the gospel, it's such a beautiful story. If we would believe in this story, if we would believe in him, we would have eternal life and would not perish. You know, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is Romans 5.8. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And you know what that means? That means that when you hated God, Maybe some of you hate God even now. Maybe he's taken somebody from you. Maybe he's taken something from you. Maybe you're in a really dark place. Maybe you're in a skeptical season. I don't even know if this story is true. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, while we were still in this place, when you hated God, he saw you and he put himself on the line 
on the off chance that maybe, just maybe, you would love them back in return. Wow. And so the Bible says that he who knew no sin actually becomes sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I'm just throwing out scriptures that speak to the gospel. The person who was sinless became sinful so that we who are sinful could look sinless before God. Is that not the gospel? Is that not something to stand up and shout about? That he who knew no sin became sin so that we might, if we believe in him, become God's righteousness? And so I believe that it's in this place where we begin to understand what it means to truly be followers of Jesus, that we would be in awe like Mary, that this is the kind of God that we serve, the one who puts himself on the line for ones who he has no clue will love him back in return. And so I just love that about our God. I love that so much. And so I don't know, maybe you've been busy in the, in the quote-unquote kitchen, You've been busy in ministry, in life. I believe that God may be just saying, slow down. Just, just see me. So we've been learning about this God who was willing to die on a cross for us. We've been learning about this God who writes about us, who collects our tears. We've learned that he is not far away. He meets us in the living room. This sermon was entitled, God in the Living Room. What does Mary sit before Jesus at? was in the living room of Martha's home. I believe that maybe God is saying today, I want to I invite you into the living room, not of your house, but of your heart. I want to be in.